New York City is taking a stand against a major banking institution, Wells Fargo. The mayor of New York, Eric Adams, says the city government will not open any new bank accounts with Wells Fargo and company due to the bank's, quote, persisting track record of discrimination. The banking giant has been embroiled in many discrimination lawsuits, the most recent one in February, for discriminatory lending practices. Uh, of course, uh, we also know that it was during the uh, housing crisis uh, where it was uh, exposed even further, uh, the roles that Will Wells Fargo played uh, when it came to uh, home ownership. One of the things that they have done uh, is uh, try to uh, sponsor a lot of different uh, black events with black organizations. But one of the things that I said is, well, how about you return the money to the people who lost their homes? You know, that, that, to me, that's really what uh, should also be done. Um, you know, th this, this, this decision here, I think, uh, is a significant one. Um, and, and in fact, um, you know, you had, the, um, you had a response. Uh, so here's the deal here. It was a, um, first of all, uh, Bloomberg uh, did their own investigation where they found that Wells Fargo had approved black homeowners seeking to refinance their mortgages at a much, during the pandemic, at a much lower rate than whites. Now, the CEO of Wells Fargo, uh, Charlie Scharf, um, said uh, that, well, first of all, the letter was sent to Wells Fargo CEO by the New York controller, Brad Lander, and the mayor. They said the decision was due to the checkered history of Wells Fargo's mortgage business going back to the 2018 financial crisis when the bank and others were accused. Now, uh, he lays out the, the persistent discrimination. Uh, and so this is the block, this is the uh, Bloomberg story uh, DeMario. Uh, this is from Yahoo News. The proof of the problem at Wells Fargo is in the numbers. Wells Fargo approved just 47 percent of black homeowners who completed applications to refinance mortgages in 2020 compared with 72 percent of whites. Now, although its approval rate for black applicants increased to 58 percent, the number for whites is 70 Nine percent, Demario. Rhoda, man, this is why I mess with you. But like you stated, don't be trying to give us sponsorships and put your name on our events and try to whitewash your sins against our people when you're not going to actually do what it takes to restore us back to what you took and stole from us. This is what's most important about this story. The fact that this mayor and this city government utilize the tools that they had at their disposal to protect black people. They punished this particular Wells Fargo, this disc discriminatory racist organization that has been shown time and time again, the numbers are right there. You just showed the audience. We're not gonna allow you to continue to make money until you fix this problem. That's all we're asking for for our elected leaders in this country. As Teresa says, come to us and uh, give us hope and change. No, give us accountability. Make our lives better. Make sure those who are praying on us stop doing it. And for black organizations, stop taking this money for these type of organ these type of corporations, whitewashing it, making them look good when in fact their policies and practices are continuing to be discriminatory and destructive to our people. And uh, again, this is uh, you know I'm I'm sorry. Th th this has to be said, and and, and there are a, a number. Uh, a number of, um, you know, organizations. I mean, it, it, look, it, it's a perfect example. And, and, and the NAACP has to answer for this, okay? They have to answer for this. This was just two years ago where uh, Wells Fargo announced they were making an investment in African-American community-based banks. The NAACP sent this release out. Uh, and then uh, says, today, Wells Fargo announced an additional $50 million investment in programs supporting economic growth in African-American communities across the country. The NAACP applauds this investment and its prospect to build uh, black financial power. Okay, so here's, here's a perfect example. The quote says, African-Americans have disproportionately been denied access to financial resources that can lead to wealth building and economic independence. 
in partnership with organizations and companies such as Wells Fargo, NAACP encourages initiatives centered on economic inclusion and financial participation of the black community. I, okay, I get it, $50 million. But how much in black wealth was lost during the home foreclosure crisis? There you go. Billion. That, see, that, that's the real issue, Teresa. How much money was lost? Well over 50 million. So um, it's interesting. Uh, what I've seen, you know, since uh, that press release actually went out, I mean, if, even if we look at the last two years, we've been seeing an uptick in two things. Uh, I'm going to just say personally what I've seen. Hopefully everybody else has seen it as well. Wells Fargo has been making a very intentional uh, sponsorship by to organization and nonprofit organizations. Well done. They've also been hiring more black and brown people in their front office. Not sure if they're in the back, but they're definitely tellers, right? They're, they're branch managers, they're associates. That's also awesome, right? But when it comes to, and again, that goes back to the numbers, which we're talking about right now, the numbers have been on the decline for no, more refinancing options. And why is that happening? The reason why it's happening is because the market has increased during the pandemic. Those who are looking for a home ownership, if you were looking for a house in 2020, and then you're like, hey, I'm, I'm done living in this area, I'm actually going to the suburbs, what you will find is that your house has more than you know 20% of an increase. I know that's true because I was personally looking for a home during the pandemic um, to be a, a, a homeowner. And when I tell you the the rates that I was I was seeing and the uh, the even the showings, even down to the showings, that's a whole nother story, right? If you have a black real estate um, uh, person, you know, uh, showing you homes and you can't get in the door, but if you reach out to somebody else who's not black or brown, that you get in in 20 minutes. So that's a whole nother story. But I think when we start looking at some of the refinance, let me go back to the topic, right? Refinancing applications. Uh, you start to see uh, the, the denial and the, the, the additional paperwork that is needed. Instead of two years, you're now asking, you know, three to four, right? And then it's long wait times, which means you probably missed your opportunity on getting that property. So we have to do more. Wells Fargo needs to do more. It's not even a we at this point. Corporations and banking institutions have to do more if they say they want to do more to getting us into these properties. But again, we can't just keep co-signing on these press releases, right? We have to follow up. Institutions that have power need to follow up and make sure that change is happening. If not, then we have to stop giving quotes. We have to stop signing off because once we get the quotes and we start, we uh, uh, stop signing off, the people is at risk. So we have to follow up and make sure these assessment points are ready. Because again, look, I'm 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 part of uh, the denial, right? But there there were some other factors. I'm like, well, I just got approved over here. Why am I getting uh, approved over here? So yeah, this, this story is definitely hitting home. It's hitting the next generation. As we talk about generational wealth, this is something that we have to um, make sure that is in our best interest moving forward. See, the, 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 the thing for me here, Mustafa, um, that, that bothers me, as, um, as, I, as I look at this. So let me, let me just show y'all just timeline. So this is the Bloomberg story from Bloomberg.com. Bloomberg says nationwide, 47% of black homeowners who completed a refinance application with Wells Fargo in 2020 were approved compared with 72% of white homeowners. This is, again, happening in 2020. This is March of 2020, where the NAACP commends Wells Fargo's investment in African-American community-based banks. This is 2010, where the NAACP sued Wells Fargo, but dropped the lawsuit, and it says Wells Fargo and the NAACP have agreed to work together on ways to improve fair credit access, home ownership, and financial literacy 
for communities of color and other historically disadvantaged communities, the two said in a joint statement. Okay, got it. That, that, that's the settlement. So this is 2010 right here. This is 2022 based upon data happening in 2020. So Wells Fargo enters into this agreement to drop a lawsuit with the NAACP. They fund the image awards and some other stuff, but they're impacted. And, and, here's, and this is the lead of the Bloomberg, Bloomberg story. When Maïs uh, Ricard III paid a $560.43 application fee to Wells Fargo and company on Valentine's Day in 2020 to refinance his mortgage on a four-bedroom brick colonial in a leafy suburb of Atlanta, he had every reason to expect an easy ride. The Microsoft Corporation engineer is married to a doctor and has a credit score north of 800, putting him in America's credit elite. The loan officer at the bank even told him he was probably eligible for a fast track appraisal. It didn't take long for problems to appear. Ricard's house and investment property that was his home before he moved to another Atlanta suburb in 2017 is in a predominantly black neighborhood. And in April, the loan officer emailed to say that, quote, perhaps the area is not eligible for a rapid valuation. By May, she was writing to say the underwriter had more questions. Soon after, Ricard was told he would have to pay a higher 4.5% rate, even though the Federal Reserve has slashed rates to historic lows. Within weeks, Wells Fargo had denied his application. Quote, they kept moving the needle, Ricard says. They didn't want to move forward for whatever reason. Now, uh, Mustafa, the, the, the people who are who are watching and I'm just going to stand up here because I can't because uh, this is like really giving me a headache. So for the people who are watching at home, what, what I need them to understand when y'all hear us talk about this stuff is I need y'all to understand that when they charge black people a higher interest rate, that means that more of our money is being spent on that mortgage, which is putting more money in their pockets, which is keeping that money from African-Americans from being invested and is keeping African-Americans from being able to save the money. And so if you want to understand what that impact is, you scroll down further in the Bloomberg story. In the Bloomberg story, they say, they say, if as expected, the Fed's policy committee moves to hike interest rates at its March meeting. It will begin to closing the door on a remarkable, listen, everybody, they will, it will begin closing the door on a remarkable wealth event that has seen U.S. homeowners refinance almost $5 trillion in mortgages over the past two years, the most since the early 2000s. It's one that, listen folks, it's one that allowed white homeowners to save, listen, to save an estimated $3.8 billion annually by refinancing their mortgages in 2020 according to researchers at the central bank. But it's a door that barely opened for black Americans who make up 9% of all homeowners and locked in just 198 million a year, less than 4% of the savings. So now let me go back. I just showed you White homeowners saved an estimated $3.8 billion. Not all of that money, not all of that money was with Wells Fargo. 
That's the total amount of money. So let me flip over here. March 2020, the NAACP is commending Wells Fargo for an additional $50 million investment in programs supporting economic growth in African American communities. I keep telling y'all and telling y'all and telling y'all, I'm sick of this bullshit of companies putting money in programs to the NAACP, to the National Urban League, to the, to the National Action Network, to Rainbow Push, to anybody else. I'm not singling anybody out. But what I'm tired of are companies sending money, putting money into black organizations that pales in comparison to the money that they are not actually giving to black people. Mm. So when Mark Morial was on here last year and I was talking about Pepsi and with his State of Black America report, by the way, Urban League, y'all don't want to come on my show this year to discuss State of Black America report? Come talk to black media. I saw the story was given to white media. I'm just saying. So here's my problem. And I said it. And I'm going to say it right now. PepsiCo. PepsiCo has a five-year, $10 million program with the Urban League to stand up black businesses. Fine. I support that. Not a problem. Absolutely support it. They were running ads as a part of their initiative to drive $100 million in receipts to black-owned restaurants over a five-year period. I support that. So that means there's one program, five years, $10 million. That means $2 million a year. This other program is to drive $100 million in receipts to black-owned restaurants. I talked to one of the black-owned restaurant owners who's on the advisory committee who says they have no mechanism to even understand if the money, what comes from what PepsiCo is driving. They have no way to track the numbers. Okay, but let's say you did. So that's 100 million over five years. That's $20 million a year. Got it? 20 million a year. Okay, so we got the Urban League program over here, $2 million a year. We got this over here, that's $20 million a year. Gotcha, so that's $22 million. Pepsi spends $3 billion a year on advertising. Three. Now, I've heard people say, oh, it's not really, that's not really it. it that, that could be a different number. It's not necessarily $3 billion. Okay, fine. Okay? But I'm going to use $3 billion for this exercise. Okay? I'm going to use $3 billion for this exercise. So, if I'm sitting here looking at um, the calculator. And if I'm looking at how much money is being spent, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to sit here and go, okay, uh, I'm looking at $3 billion, okay? $3 billion, cool. So if 5%, if Pepsi spends, 5% of its annual marketing budget with black-owned media. Just marketing. Y'all, we ain't talking other goods and services. We're not talking black transportation companies. We're not talking black law firms. We're not talking black PR firms. We're not talking black event uh, planning companies. We're not talking um, any number. We're talking solely black owned media. If 5% of Pepsi's marketing budget, which right now is probably 0.5 or 1% if that, went to black owned media, that means that Pepsi would be spending, I said 5%, y'all, $150 million a year with black owned media. It ain't hard. $3 billion, 10% of $3 billion is $300 million. Five, five, cut that in half, it's $150 million. 
So that means, I told y'all, the Urban League program, black people are getting two million a year. The restaurant program, black people will be getting 20 million a year. If we got 5% of the advertising dollars from PepsiCo, black owned media companies will be getting 150 million a year. Urban League, five years, $10 million. That's five years. So that's $10 million. The restaurants over here, 100 million, five years, that's 100 million. So that's 100 million plus 10 million, 110 million. If we got 5% of advertising dollars for five years, black owned media would get 750 million. Which one of those is greater? 110 million or 750 million? So, if you run the numbers that's in the story, if Wells Fargo is denying black people, so if 72% of white homeowners are getting refinanced and 47% of black homeowners are getting refinanced, you got to ask yourself the question, how many Remember, remember, I said overall, white folks save $3.8 billion annually. Well, if this is the case, what's annually the millions that black people would save if we were refinanced at 72%? Y'all, that's literally 25% more. I don't know how many homeowners got Wells Fargo mortgages. But, but, but let's say, let's just say, again, let's just say, that, let's say white people were saving $500 million a year, just Wells Fargo. Now we already know three point numbers are much higher than that. So 3.8 billion annually. But let's just say Wells Fargo alone is 500 million. Okay. So that means that if black people had 20%, we were, we were 25% lower, then that means that that's $125 million. It's $125 million. Now, again, that means that black people, if we were at the rates of white people, we will be saving on an annual basis 125 million more than we're saving right now. How much money did Wells Fargo put in these black banks? 50 million. Is it 50 million every year? So that means that black homeowners, we're losing out on how much money? So Wells Fargo, I would love to know how much money are you give into all these black organizations for tables and events? How much money are you spending on black advertising? Does it equal the 125 million? Does it exceed it? Please, by all means, share. This is why I keep trying to say on this show, black people, let's stop playing ourselves small. General Motors. They're having their second annual media upfront for black owned businesses in a couple of weeks. I got the invite. Unless I see a signed contract from General Motors in the next two weeks, I'm not going. Do you know why? Because I went last year. What happened? We've had a bunch of meetings, but what has happened? I think it was Teresa who said earlier we were talking about statements and, and, you know, what we see in press releases. I told the people at General Motors, I will not applaud you for press releases and announcements. I will applaud you when you make direct deposits. <laughs> and what we are seeing, Mustafa and Demario, we are seeing these white-led companies 
with sprinkles of black faces, largely in community affairs or now DEI, not in PL positions, who literally are giving black people philanthropy, not investment. Mm. And at some point, we've got to have black organizations. We've got to have black civil rights organizations to stop accepting crumbs and actually begin to demand and negotiate multi-billion dollar settlements with major corporations. I don't give a shit about them hosting a damn reception at a civil rights organization's conference. If you withheld 100 to 200 to 300 to 500 million dollars from black people, then there should be an annual investment going back to black people equaling the money that you withheld. That is the only way we're going to change this. At some point, we've got to stop being pimped and demand our money. Mustafa. You know, you know me. I'm often talking about how our communities continue to get pimped. Sometimes we get pimped by our own organizations, but we definitely get pimped because we allow folks to actually buy us off and then to not live up to what they say they're going to do. And then they say, well, you know, I love you. And then we're like, oh, I guess you do love me. So I come back and I let you pimp me again. And then I let you pimp me again. And I let you pimp me again. And until we change that dynamic, we're going to continue to get pimped. The other part of the conversation is about this 21st century black tax that we continue to see play out, which addresses the black wealth white gap that we have in our country. And if we don't begin to better understand it and call it out. So when you have uh, you know, folks with the same credit score as somebody else, but yet they're gonna ask you to pay a higher percentage, that speaks to the wealth that you could have built during that time period. When we look in our communities, we pay more for food. We pay more for auto insurance. We pay more for our housing insurance. Of course, we pay more for our mortgages. All of this plays into not just how much money you make on your job, that extra 5 or $10 that you get excited about, but generational wealth. Generational wealth actually comes through you owning real estate um, or through land or a number of other types of things. But if you don't have access to be able to garner the resources that are necessary for you to be able to begin to build that wealth, then you're going to continue to lag behind. So one, we got to stop being pimped, and two, we got to understand the 21st century black tax that is happening inside of our communities. I'm, I'm just not, here's the deal. Damn people's feelings, Teresa. I'm, I'm, I, I, I'm not going to apologize to any civil rights organization. What I'm going to say is, are you demanding real money? Mm -hmm. I'm not talking about a damn table, some bullshit reception on awards program. I'm talking about real money. I am tired of black people having the opportunity to have leverage and influence and not using it sitting at the table of power. Mm. That's what this boils down to. What are we getting in return? But we've got folks sitting here just happy. Oh, they gave us some money. Same thing happened when Comcast got NBC Universal. And Congresswoman Maxine Waters has said this. She said that she was undercut by black civil rights organizations who agreed to a memorandum of understanding with the company. And in the damn MOU, it says this is non-binding. Mm. And then what happened? Byron Allen sues him. Comcast and the civil rights groups. Diddy comes out with a letter saying how he was underfunded and didn't have the distribution he should have had. Africa Channel says the exact same thing. All these things happen. So for, oh, 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 Comcast, they gonna create eight minority networks, but will they fully distribute them? The answer was no. Will they give them a fair distribution fee? The answer was no. But, oh, we hyped because, oh, they said they're going to create eight networks. And so 
who actually benefited from those MOUs. Mm. This is why. This is why I said to the minority coaches, if y'all fighting for more black and brown coaches, don't you let no civil rights group have a meeting with the NFL commissioner unless y'all lead in the meeting. Because can't nobody negotiate for you who ain't got skin in the game. It's the same reason when, when NABJ went out to CNN, I told every civil rights group, don't y'all have y'all own meeting? Mm -hmm. We leading this. Y'all can stand behind us. Y'all can be with us. Um, but you ain't having your own meetings and we ain't in the room. Y'all, this is, I'm talking, we are literally, Teresa, leaving billions on the table and accepting crumbs. Roland, this is a message that every single person from 18 to 64 needs to listen to. Like, I, I'm thank you know, you guys got me on mute, but <laughs> I've been wanting to say amen, testify, and moreover, because once you get an understanding, right, about uh, black economics and what we're actually really talking about here, right, I'm a millennial. I have no problem with saying that. I'm a millennial. You know, I know black people, we age gracefully, but, like, literally, I'm a millennial, right? But... Some of the issues that I've been going through, um, going through, and some of the uh, experiences that I've heard from some of my counterparts is exactly this, right? I remember NABJ when I, I believe CNN didn't even want you in the room, right? And you're a part of that network. Part of the reason is why, because you actually know what the demands are, right? You you know what Black economics actually looks like. So we they want somebody that is literally going to ask them for the bare minimum. So no longer can we ask larger billion-dollar corporations of uh, uh, about um, our fair share or about our economic worth without actually knowing exactly what we're asking for. So sometimes everybody wants to take the meeting and they're not doing the research. And half the battle is if you're not prepared to go in the room and ask for what you want, then you're just going to be given exactly what they want to give you without knowing that there is so many millions and billions of dollars at the table. And as people are saying, look, I'm fighting for my kids, you know, I'm fighting for my cousins and my nieces and my nephews, then you actually need somebody knowledgeable in the room to understand the deal, understand the contracting process, understand basic accounting and balance sheets, right? I get at my elected officials all the time and I'm like, listen, we can't be talking about budgets and, you know, just making up numbers about thousands of dollars is going to these programs and organizations when we haven't had a fundamental conversation about the budget. And who's known as accounting? If you don't know accounting, then we need to outsource that to make sure that somebody could get the numbers right. So half the battle is knowing the numbers and knowing your audience. And if you don't know your audience, which in this case is million and billion dollar corporations who have made billions on the backs of blacks and black and brown people have not, have not been made whole. And that's why the struggle and this fight continues. And so it takes this continued wisdom. It takes the continued education. It takes, look, sometimes even critical race theory, right? For us to know where our history was and know where the economic uh, shortfall actually came in order for us to progress and towards the future. So that's why I'm excited about this conversation and I'm excited about learning more. But what we can't do is allow some of these organizations that is like, look, I'm OK with taking crumbs, pennies on the dollar, because that's not what's going to help uh, continue economic growth. Right. And so what I want people to understand and what I've had to learn in almost seven years of business is that you have to ask for what you want. But before you go in the room and make your ask, you got to know how much you're losing. And if you know what that cost is, then you know exactly how to make your number um, to that organization effectively. All right, folks, back to our Roland Mark Unfiltered video in just one moment. Folks, Black Star Network is here. Hold no punches. I'm real um, revolutionary right now. Black Support this man, Black Media. He makes sure that our stories are told. I thank you for being the voice of Black America, Roland. Hey, Black. All momentum we have now 
We have to keep this going. The video looks phenomenal. See, this difference between Black Star Network and Black-owned media and something like CNN. You can't be Black-owned media and be scared. It's time to be smart. Bring your eyeballs home. You dig?